start button there on that uh, laptop. Which is uh, uh, just the little, the middle one? Space bar. Okay. Space bar. Is it gone? Yes, sir. From Atlanta, Georgia. Georgia. I have to look at it, just kind of look at it. Serving up the hottest comedy in the South. Starring... I will get to you, Greg. You know, being a team can be a lot of fun, but there are drawbacks that mess with everything. You know, I like comedy for one thing and one thing only. Being too loud for me. Please. Feel free to comment on anything you like, too. Oh, I'm starting already? Brown, who's now one of the great radio comedians in history. And there's a skinny me talking to Grant Turner, the second funniest human being that ever lived. Next to Jim Carrey, I think Grant Turner's the funniest human being I ever met. I weighed 175 pounds. I'm in my uh, Ward Cleaver outfit. Here's Fox really talking about leaving IBM to go into comedy and wondering if he's going to make it. <laughs> Rob Cleveland, he probably still looks the exact same as he does on this tape. Rob Cleveland will be 85 years old and look just like he did on this video. There's James Gregory about... <laughs> There's James Gregory about 80 pounds ago. <laughs> Look, there's a duck. <laughs> Lewis Nixon, who Lewis was was a great comedian, but what was what was always so funny about Lewis was he went out with the woman who won the Hawaiian Tropic National. B bikini contest who ended up being a soap opera actress and we were all uh, we were all jealous of Lewis Steve Mitchell there's Steve Mitchell back when he had blonde hair see the Steve Mitchell I know has gray hair <laughs> He's got brown, he's got blonde hair, and then there's some guy filming me with, he ain't got no hair. This is 96 Rock doing this. This is back when 96 Rock gave a damn about comedy. I just want to let you know that Tim won, okay, on this one. <laughs> yeah, he really did. This is something that uh, 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 he had his troubles with the IRS, and now I just tell him to all go fuck yourselves, okay? <clears throat> Seriously. Anyway, I've known Tim. I knew Tim for 30 years. I represented him for 28 of those 30 years. And in that time, so many things happened that it's very difficult for me to bring all of it back or try and tell a, a, a certain story. I will tell some in between. Uh, I want to run a quick tape first of Tim, and this is one of his first spots on television. This is way back in, I think, oh God, I think it was 85. Uh, it was Evening at the Improv. That's what I want to run, Rich, okay? 
And uh, you'll see uh, Sally Kellerman was the, the woman that uh, was introducing him on stage, but this will go for about four minutes and then we'll come, I'll come back on and we'll uh, bring somebody else back on to tell some stories. And we'll, we'll do that all night long if you, if you have the time and the patience to put up with us. Okay, Greg, you ready with that one? Okay, let's go, turn the lights on. How y'all doing? Good mood? Good crowd. Had an embalming fluid crowd the other night. Had to get the electric things out clear, get them going again. Had to start an IV with D5W and transport immediately. Don't remember that show, Emergency? And it doesn't matter what happened, they fall off a building, you hit by a truck, you start an IV with D5W and transport immediately. I always thought he'd start an IV with WD-40 and transport immediately. Huh? <laughs> and they always called in, you know, Rampart, we've got a male victim. I'm like nine years old, going to start a damn IV with D-5W and transport the guy. You've got to be a paramedic to know that. Huh? Well, uh, my name's Tim Wilson. I'm originally from the entertainment capital of the world, Columbus, Georgia. Uh, yeah, that is. It's good to be in California, but then good to be anywhere. I just got back from a three and a half week trip in the Middle East. <laughs> Honest to God, true story. So we went Passover visiting and uh, my wife was in the army for about two years in Israel. You always see this NRA type. I got this little gun right here for my wife. Something she could handle? <laughs> I go, yeah, I got this little Uzi right here for my wife. But something she could oil and clean in the damn dark, you know? <laughs> We hear noises at home. My wife goes, don't worry, honey. I'll go see what it is. Yeah. Uh, okay. Good. But you don't see nobody throwing no damn rocks in my neighborhood, though, boy, either. Good. 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 Learning to speak a little Hebrew. My wife yells when the dog at home in Hebrew. And so far, so far, I've learned no pukaka ala shatia. I mean, don't, don't shit on the carpet. Which not really going to be enough to get my butt into rabbinical school or anything, but... She's out in the yard screaming in Hebrew, and everybody thinks we're speaking in tongues or something. <laughs> Our neighbors are afraid to come meet us. They're afraid we're Pentecostal. Study. When to visit relatives in this? When we go visit my relatives, they live in Alabama. You know, you go over and they go, "Well, Fred and Doc got a brand new house in Birmingham, and they just really enjoying it. And he transferred from his job in Mobile, and they got the new house, and we're just so proud of them." I was wondering if relatives in Israel, well, well Shmuley and Oshnot got a brand new house in Nazareth, and, and they transferred from his job in Bethlehem. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. You pull over, you ask directions. Excuse me, you come out to get to Jerusalem from here. Yeah, you go right on up here, you get to the Sea of Galilee, you're going to see a small bridge. Go right over the top of it up there. But as you go over the hill, you're going to see a shepherd and a bunch of sheep. Take right, that's your North Star. <laughs> go down, you're going to hear some sporadic gunfire. It's going to be right down there on your left. <laughs> I'm here, and I, I think it's hotter than here than it was there. Might want to turn those French fry lights up a little bit more. I'm waiting on the damn, <laughs> waiting on the bell to go off up here. <laughs> but I got home from Israel and I went and flew here to do this show, and my car broke down on the way to the airport. And how many of y'all got GM cars here? Yeah, yeah proud of them too, boy. <laughs> GM cars got about thirty thousand miles on them. Alternator looks the water pump. Goes, how many miles you got? Yeah. Yeah, let's all fall a damn park right now. <laughs> Had a thing called a distributor module. Got to up on my carts. So the points used to be in a distributor cap. And put a little chip out, put it back on, $35, you're down the road. Took me nine mechanics to figure out what it was. Well, it sounded like the engine. <laughs> yep, your whole damn engine. 
It's going to cost you about $1,200. Uh, $1,275. About $1,290. About $1,800. <laughs> Give him out of town. Take me about six days to put it on. Hell, you can just stay at our house. <laughs> Or you get that mechanic just like an guy of the sixth grade, but he talks over your head so high you don't know what he's talking about. But well, we can do one or two things to it. I can pull your hose off the top of your intake manifold, create a vacuum down the top of the piston, try to grind an oil out of the top of the piston, pull your header gasket down off the top, and unhook your electrical switch from a starter and reset up your flywheel. <laughs> pull your timing chain down around a gear shifter and the transmission. Pull your exhaust manifold off and clean it out, pull the boat out and hook the hose to it. <laughs> or, <laughs> we just change the oil. As you can see, that was one of Tim's first TV spots. That was on, uh, I think, 1986 or 87. And uh, that was actually at the Santa Monica Improv, which isn't there any longer. And hopefully the same thing will happen with the one in Atlanta very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help it. Um, the funny thing about that is, and I'm going to get a quick story of what happened at the end of this show. Sally Kirkland was fairly enamored with Tim. So her and Sylvester Stallone's mom took him home that night. And just to talk, okay, that's what wound up happening, was talking all night long, okay? Tim told me, he goes, guess where I was? And I got, no, I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine, okay? He goes, I'm Sylvester Stallone's mom's house. I goes, what? You know, how did that happen? You just flew into L.A. and you wound up at her house. Anyway, but that's some of the things... You know, the unusual things that happened to Tim were always amazing. But um, I have, uh, Roy Wood Jr. is going to go out and tell a quick story. And Roy, you've seen him on uh, Solid and Sons and a number of other things. But uh, uh, please, Roy, if you come up here, please. I'm uh, happy to be here. I wasn't able uh, to come to the situation in Columbus. Uh, I'll share a quick one. Um, so Tim, Tim was like one of the first headliners that I worked for. Like when I started, I started like down south in like Tallahassee and all that stuff. So you know, you see all the road guys or whatever. And when I was featuring, he was one of the first headliners that I worked for that was kind of like a draw in a sense where you knew the people were there to see him. And like like most young comics, I was very cocky. I was very, you know, I was like 21, 22. And you know, I was very like as a feature, all you're thinking is, I gotta blow out the headliner. I gotta go on stage and just demolish so hard that the headliner can't possibly follow me. He'll get fired from this show. <laughs> They'll put my name on the sign, they will take his name down, and I'll get paid triple tomorrow night. <laughs> So I opened the, the the night I met Tim Wilson was in Richmond, Virginia, um, 02, 03. I didn't get a chance to go home and look back at my old date books to verify it, but um, it's in some garbage ass room. And, and it, it was like a rock, it wasn't even a club for comedy. And I, I'm like, who's Tim Wilson? And there's a line out the door. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm gonna go on stage. I'm gonna roast this white dude. I'm gonna demolish this dude. And, I go on stage and I do I do fairly well and <laughs> Tim Wilson goes out on stage and we met before the show. It was very brief. Hey, how you doing? Where you from? I'm down, I'm down. He comes out on stage and he doesn't say a word. The crowd's screaming. He doesn't say a word. He just pulls on his guitar and he just two strums and the crowd just blah. I, to this day, I don't have a joke that has done anything close <laughs> to what two fucking just a problem. <laughs> and so, by the end of the show, you know, he was very personal. He was very, a very polite man, and he was he was one of the headliners that was very polite to feature acts because 
that's not commonplace either. Um, you know, he, was, he always treated you like an equal. And so here I am walking into this situation thinking, yeah, I want to. I'm the, and I hate all comedians. I'm the funniest comedian on earth and not realizing that there's a plethora of stuff to learn. You know, working with Tim was always an impromptu internship on how to do this for a living. <laughs> and that's kind of how the relationship began. And so fast forward to years later, when I started headlining myself, I didn't work with them as much until we, we did Bob and Tom gigs together. And so one night at a hotel on a Bob and Tom show, and, you know, Tim has been politicking the whole night about, about you know, serious debate issue stuff. And he's like, Roy, you have to agree with me no matter what, because I have a black wife and you are not allowed. <laughs> like, I always had that. Like, I never met you, but I just feel like I know you because I, I had to take a side. <laughs> and so Tim had a way of saying stuff. I think we all know this, where... You know, he's a man that spoke in metaphors and analogies and stuff like that. He couldn't just tell you what the hell was going on. And so, we're at a bar in a hotel, and this is in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, and we've done the show, we're back at the hotel, everybody's at the bar. There's one chick at the end of the bar, and I decide, I'm going to say something to her. She's hot, she curves and everything, and she appears to be alone, and me being the weird stalker I am, I stare down for like 45 minutes to make sure that she's alone. And I look over at her, and Tim, Tim comes over to me, he goes, Roy, see what you're doing. Just because it's a frog, don't mean it's going to say ribbit. <laughs> going, what? <laughs> and I can write it off as he's drunk. Hey, he's drunk. Shut up, you know. LeBron, I'll tell you again. Just because it looked like a frog, don't mean it's going to say ribbit. No, whatever. So I down another shot of whiskey. I go to the other side of the room and I start talking to this lady. And we're talking five, ten minutes. Where you from? What are you doing? And, you know, I'm saying all this stuff to impress her. Oh, I'm a comedian. Friends, we all did a comedy show tonight. And like 10 minutes into the conversation, I start noticing certain aspects of the facial features. <laughs> you know, like you have windows of sobriety. Even when you're drunk, you still have, like every hour, you get like three minutes <laughs> of just legitimate cognitive thought. And, and that three minutes came as I was talking to this, uh, uh, to this lady. And I'm like, this is not a lady. This is a dude. <laughs> and he's totally into me. Like, I'm too hooked up. Like, he's, he wants all parts. He's, yeah, so where do you else do you do comedy? I'm interested. I'm like, I'll be right back. <laughs> so I go back to Tim and Greg Hahn on that side of the bar. And Tim goes, well, what did you learn? I said, that all frogs don't say ribbon. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally understood at that time what that was about. But that was my Tim story, man. He was a wonderful man, and I hate to see him go. And, you know, I just hope that, you know, something like this helps us to remember those times. Thank you, guys. Well, sir, how was, uh, how long have you been playing? How long have you been playing the punchline? I've been working at the punchline since August of 1983, which is a long time. But for Southern comedians, this is headquarters as far as comedy goes. I mean, the punchline started comedy in the South, and it, uh, you know, it spread from here. So, so like James Gregory said, this is the church. Give it up for Mr. Tim Wilson. Yeah. Actually, people. 
Carter's up. Shit. Hang it on. Fellas and dates ought to be getting here any minute. I don't know where the hell they are. Man. Hung up or some shit. Give me a little more monitor there. Turn that fucker up. Just push it up to damn eight. Whatever. Man, was that your daddy or a business trip? Shit. Whatever you're doing, sir, keep doing it. You got one guy, 36 dates at this table. It's a bad Mormon thing or some shit. Black people on my show. Good to have you. It's rare. <laughs> yeah. You want to like working with Drew? Yeah. Let me bring some people yeah. beside yeah. fucking white people. He got his feet. He got his feet. That's a lot, white church. Everybody's paying attention to you, not paying attention to me. <laughs> I can tell by looking, we're the only ones in this room that voted for Barack Obama for President of the United States. <laughs> Shit was easy for you to do. Wasn't easy for me to do. I'm going to crack her ass, Georgia ass. Cracker ass, Georgia ass. And I hope you don't turn out to be Jimmy Carter with a tan. Huh. I couldn't do the McCain thing. My friends, <laughs> my fellow prisoners. <laughs> they voting for Bevis or some shit. Wait a minute, John McCain was in the military. Fuck Lee Harvey Oswald was in the military. Benedict Arnold was in the military. Jimmy Hendrix was a paratrooper. My cousin was in Vietnam, hell, he's framing houses in North Georgia. I don't want that asshole being paid. He might make a pretty good FEMA director. How he never shows up? He knows quite a bit about judging show horses. Which was W's criteria for FEMA director. Only FEMA I saw Katrina was Kafima Jackson. She's holding a big arm load of huggies going, where are those motherfuckers? I bad the people in Mississippi lost their houses. But I didn't really feel all that bad about it. Hell, I almost lost a house on a blackjack table in Biloxi, Mississippi. <laughs> and those people didn't give a fuck. I didn't see a $2,000 credit card and a Red Cross truck waiting on my ass when I left out of Mississippi. And I specifically remember when I doubled down on that 11 and that Mississippi woman hit me with a two. I think I said, dear God, if you ever get a chance to blow these assholes away with a hurricane. <laughs> well, I'm starting to think it was me. <laughs> when Cherokee gets hit by a locust, you'll know it was me. Listen to my ass on it. Let it ride, table up there. Who do I have to blow to get the monitors turned on in this club? Hello? Does anybody work here? Last show I had a problem. Got three thousand dollars worth of monitors. I can't hear a damn thing. If anybody decides to go back to fucking work, especially the sound man, can we turn the monitors up, Mr. Ted? And while we're at it, pick it up. Bar towel, one of the waitresses. No real hurry on it. Just try to get in here today. <laughs> Remind me to cut a live album the next time you fuckers are here. <laughs> Just get in there. You people really don't even understand my job. Y'all think my job is to come in here and tell you a bunch of jokes. You know what my real job is? To be a bigger dick than you fellas. <laughs> that way on the way home, I'm going to hook up that hill, but you son of a bitch. You might be dressed like Jimmy Buffett, but you're not as bad as that fucker. And you get laid later, sir. You'll see my name on that sign out there in about six months. I got laid last time I saw that egg, so. And that is my job. You're welcome. Well, I'm doing okay, man. This ain't one of my better shows, I can already tell. <laughs> Why? Because ain't nobody in the front. Ain't got nobody to pick on but Jimmy Buffett, man, and fucker with the bad toupee. Here he is. <laughs> I'm wanting to talk about hair. I got 12 hanging on here. If I ever get to heaven, I'm going to find the hair angel and whip his ass. Because <laughs> yours fell out symmetrically. Let's go. I got that mange shit. You mean, this went, this day just sucks. Every time I see Pat Buchanan on TV, I go, fucker's got my hair. If I knew I was going bald, I wish I'd have gone bald all at once. This half bullshit just kind of sucks. Can we turn the french fry lights up just to tell? Waiting on the damn bell to go off up here. It's about hotter than a four ball monkey up here about now. So they can sweat in your drink from here, man. Get 
a margarita. You won't taste it. Ooh. Mom, I don't need your help at this point. This show's going down the fucking tubes. Let me do it by myself. Uh, everybody, ladies are going to say Tim Wilson sucked. They're not going to say you sucked. So just, just hush. Let me. Sarah, if you can't control your dick, damn it, get her out. <laughs> Starting to like this crap. <laughs> what else? Who am I talking about? John McCain? War hero. Yeah, my ass, you're a POW. Ross McGinnis, war hero. 21 years old, over to grenades, say five is Marine friends, Congressional Medal of Honor, that's war hero. P.O.W., slow soldier. Possibly shit pilot. Brave man, tough man, no doubt about that. I'd have sucked as a P.O.W. Come to get me, hand me a pencil piece of paper. There's a brigade behind me, a kid named Chuck flying a helicopter. Here's his home address and phone number. How do you spell war criminal? Seeing all y'all staring at me. He's disrespecting the men and women in uniform. Alvin C. York, World War I. Him and four other men captured 135 German soldiers by themselves. York went back and got 200 more by his damn self. Brought him in, Congressional Medal of Honor. My question, did any of those German soldiers go back to Germany and run for president as war heroes? Oh, fuck. I think I logically won my argument. <laughs> Let's get one thing across before we go any further. I've been in this ship 28 years. I started on this stage when I was about 21 years old. There ain't nobody in a 300-mile radius of here who knows more about stand-up comedy than me. So if I think something's relatively fucking humorous, odds are it is. <laughs> and watch a bunch of civilians staring at my ass. <laughs> See, Drew's here because he can make women laugh. I can't make a woman laugh for any reason. They have no fucking desire to laugh at anything I say. See, ladies always say, oh, I want a guy with a sense of humor. No, they don't. They want a guy who will laugh at shit they say. Big difference. I watch a lot of basketball wives. Because I'm gay in the afternoon. <laughs> basketball wives. And none of the ladies are married to basketball players. One lady's going to marry a football player and she's on basketball wife. Shaquille O'Neal's wife divorced him. She's this tall. They got a mansion, cute kids, $400 million. She couldn't get happy. Shaquille O'Neal wears a 25 shoe. $400 million, cute kids, indoor basketball coach. She can't make it work. I've got a 12 shoe, 6 inch dick. Which means minimum, minimum, that fucker's a 12 and a half. $400 million, indoor basketball coach, cute children. What's going to make her happy? It's going to have to be A-Rod, and he's going to have to bring a baseball bat. <laughs> this crowd's starting to lighten the fuck up just a little bit. I'm running for dictator 2012. Tim Wilson for benevolent dictator. Some shit's going to change. First thing to go, spandex bicycle man. He's gone. You're going to finally be able to ride down a two-lane road in this country without crossing the center line, taking out a family of six, so Ian's ass can keep his thighs looking tight. Okay, if you can't pedal 55, Nigel, get the fuck off the road. That's all I'm saying. Next thing to go, Middle Eastern car bombs. Not going to be any when I'm dictator. Why? There's not going to be any cars in the Middle East. They're going to have a large mule bomb problem when I get to the I'm going to solve the car company problem. Get somebody who can take very little and make billions of dollars. Snoop Dogg is in charge of GM. <laughs> Jay-Z's got Ford. P. Diddy's got Chrysler. And we're giving AMC back to Billy Ray Cyrus' kid. 
I'm going to solve the immigration problem. Anybody that's a Mexican person wants to work hard, be an American, come on over. I'm going to the prisons. Every one of you fuckers in an orange jumpsuit, get your shit. Ten minutes, you're Mexican. <laughs> Have mama's calling. Is my son still in jail? You got 10 minutes, he's gonna be Mexican. <laughs> but he didn't take Spanish in high school. <laughs> well, we got a Rosetta Stone tape and an El Toro menu on the bus. <laughs> Starting to like this crap. He's wearing an old Atlanta Braves hat. Good to have you, sir. See, I, I'm, I'm from Georgia. I lived in Atlanta for 20 years. I grew up, you know, I remember when the Atlanta Braves couldn't win a good church league game. I'm talking about the Mike Lum years. Remember those years? He's a hitting coach somewhere. Fuck. <laughs> Dale Murphy, he was a good player, but they never ever surrounded him with anybody who knew any damn thing about it. The worst baseball player that ever lived played for the Atlanta Braves, his name was Paul Casanova. He was a catcher. He used to go to Crawford Long, kid be laying there sick in the hospital. Hey, kid, I'm going to hit you a home run today. Kid go, yeah, right, you foul tap a ball. My ass will get wet. <laughs> you might have a good bump, this whole damn wing will get out of the bucket. <laughs> I always loved Hank Aaron, I loved them Ralph Gard. Remember Ralph Gard, butt legged? Walk up. <laughs> See, all these other people, oh, we left the bridge when they was winning. Fuck that. Go on to something else. <laughs> what else? I'm just trying to remember my act at this point. <laughs> Sir, I ain't seen as much cleavage as a plate nine holes with Tiger Woods. <laughs> you kill him. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. <laughs> ain't even damn concentrate up here. <laughs> Is Dog the Bounty Hunter still on TV? Yes. What channel is he on? A and E. Well, fuck, that's why I couldn't find him. When I think of arts and entertainment, I don't really think of pepper spray. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they ought to have him on a religious network. Hell, they pray and cry more than Jim and Tammy Baker on that damn show. If I ever skip bail, that's who I want chasing me, though. <laughs> who is it? Well, it's either the cops or the bass player from Molly Hatchet. He's here with a roller derby woman and two Ferris wheel ticket takers. They're here. They're here to take your ass back to the pocket. Dog's wife in a bathing suit will just about ruin Hawaii for you. You know what I'm She's one of the few women in the world who can actually fuck up Dollywood. Lord knows that ain't easy. Everybody's about old as hell in here. Jeez. Any youngsters anywhere? Youngsters? Oh, all the girls are young. How old are you, sir? 26. 26. Don't know shit. You're in here looking for a co-signer right now. 26. How old are you, sir? Uh, Me and him used to do a thing called go outside and play. It was like a weird thing. <laughs> you lived in a house, and there was a road in front of your house you could actually cross without a booster seat or an eggshell bicycle fucking helmet. <laughs> and there were people who lived in that house who actually knew you. And you'd knock on the door and go outside and play with their kid until it got dark. With a thing called a stick. <laughs> and then your mom would come to the door and say, it's time for a thing that we used to call dinner. That's way back. Women would do a thing called cook. <laughs> and there'd be like four or five pots on the stove. Look at some lasagna they were proud of in the Kroger's and shit. <laughs> we used to ride our bikes to damn star by our damn selves. Be six, seven, eight miles away from home. Parents didn't give a damn. Where are them kids at? Hell, I don't know. Glad they're gone. <laughs> eight, nine years old. Gonna get you a carton of Marlboro 100. House Forum magazine. Yeah. Look out the story. You boys need some lighters with them cigarettes. <laughs> they go, oh, we got daddy's lighter. Well, you better change clothes before you get home. They'll smell smoke. You'll get a thing that we used to call an ass whipping. <laughs> That's something they quite issue about 26 fucking years ago, sir. 
when you get a beard gut and no hair, you're gonna understand how much 26 cracks my ass. So. We didn't have any bicycles like you little fuckers had. Flip around, flying, going over your cliff, upside down, all that bullshit. We had to hold on with two big toes on a luck nut, didn't we, sir? And a sissy bar, banana seat. Easy rider handlebars. You go flipping that damn thing around, you get a scrotum sack on your reflector. 26. 26? I'm a little 20 year old wanted to beat my ass in a Midas Muffler shop parking lot the other day. I'm 49 trying to get a Suburban across 17 lanes of fucking traffic. He pulls up in the Honda Fast and Furious. He obviously can't drift yet. What you gonna do, bitch? I said, before we start, I'm still living in 1974. And I'd appreciate son of a bitch. You might beat my ass, but I'm gonna win in court. Cause you get over 40, that fighting shit stops. Not because you won't win, cause you stay in the hospital twice as long as the kid who's ass you. Be at church Sunday. Tim Wilson's still in the hospital. The Catholics don't laugh at that joke. Y'all services are a lot more regimented. Oh, 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 oh. Go back to Tim Wilson's having some tests run Tuesday. It's some sort of testicular shit. A 20 year old kicked him in the nuts without a smoking shot. We're gonna keep him and his family in our prayer. 26. Let me explain something to you, sir. Me and him, him and fuck him. We grew up in cars with no air conditioning. Our entire childhood was spent with our ass melted to a final seat. 100 degree heat. And then once in a while you daddy'd have mercy on you. Open no triangle when it's up. In the line. You had one speaker in a steel dashboard. And that fucker didn't go. That's why Ring of Fire by Johnny Cash was such a hit. We all knew that song sucked, but we were relating to it. Our ass was on fire. They'd take every kid in the neighborhood and pack them in the back of a thing called a station fucking wagon. There was a well-designed vehicle with the back seat pointing the opposite direction. So five-year-olds could shoot birds and triplets. Have them packed in the back. Lay it in the window of the car. With no seat belts. Nobody gave a fuck about kids back in them days. You drop a kid out of a station wagon in the early 70s, and you just turn around and go get his ass. I never even saw a seat belt, was it? What, 15 years old? Only time you ever saw one when you dropped a quarter under the seat, be looking for it. I can't find it, Diddy. Something's in the way. What's this? Pack that shit back down in there. That's gonna fly around and hurt somebody. The only good news about a station wagon was if you broke down between here and then and you had enough wood on the side to keep a good fire going. I'll take that stretch between noon and Columbus, Georgia, and just give back to fucking India. Ain't nobody really using that property for a damn thing out there. That's how you know white people fucked over the India. Well, y'all you know, gotta get your shit, get off of here. We might name something after you. But we ain't gonna go use this land for a damn thing. As long as you promise not to use the land. We ain't gonna use that stretch between noon and Columbus for a damn thing. I thought that was funny. Can we get the monitors turned up? Does anybody really give a fuck that I can't hear anything? Did I ask for the ladies to fucking say something? These fellas, these tables, y'all got to step up and get these women to hush. 
Ma'am, I don't live in 2011. I'm still in about 71. I ain't leaving the fucking 70s. Fuck all this shit they got going now. Do I look like I have a Twitter page, Ma'am? Do I look like the peer pressure type? My daddy was the assistant principal of a junior high school for 25 years. I got my ass beat by a professional. <laughs> Drop a dime on the ground, reach over, pick it up, boom, tag me. To this day, every time I see Roosevelt's face, I want to grab my ankle. <laughs> Corporal punishment only creates inner turmoil in the child. What's your negative response? My daddy whooped the preacher and three of the pallbearers at his funeral. <laughs> That's a true story. They won't let kids pray in school. Then they wonder why test scores are going down. I'm just praying for monitor. That's all I'm praying for. It's about, it's about right there. Turn the fucker up. Right Have a good show. You had a good show in this club all fucking week. Grew up in Georgia. I live in Kentucky now. They got electricity up there. I guess it's Sandy Springs Corporate Incorporated or something. We can't get fucking electricity on. Am I on some sort of blooper show or some shit? La -da -da -da. I remember when Atlanta used to have sound men and sound boards and stuff. Back when we had great bands, Skinner. Yeah. Under rhythm section, yeah. Allman Brothers, yeah. all that. Now they got a bunch of fucking stereo on it. We'll move on to something else. Our next guest earned a degree in English, and then he began a career as a serious songwriter. That's why he's now in comedy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tim Wilson. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, and you started out in acting, and now you're hosting, so. <laughs> hey, you gotta get people back. How are you tonight? Well, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> hope, you had a, hope you had a nice Easter and Passover if you're Jewish, and hope you had a nice average week for all you atheists, because I know we've got to respect your right to burn in hell. <laughs> oh, don't feel sorry for the atheists now. I always wonder, what do atheists hunt for on Halloween, or Halloween, Easter? What do atheists hunt for on Easter? A place to hide? <laughs> I always love coming on television and laughing at atheists, you know? Agnostics always bother me. They're like, well, we kind of believe, but we kind of don't. Well, we kind of do, but we kind of don't. And I'm like, well, that's what Peter's going to say when you're at the pearly gates. He's going, well, we kind of want you, but well, we kind of don't. You know? <laughs> Have a round of applause for Easter. Thank you very much. I had kind of a weird Easter this year, boy. I don't know, I, I wound up, I want to say hello to Pete and Brian, a couple of friends of mine. We wound up in their yard half the day shooting the, the ears off a chocolate rabbit with a 12-gay shotgun. <laughs> you know you've lost the feel for Easter when you're standing there with a Remington pump in a straw basket, throwing them up going, pull, pull. <laughs> Something just ain't right about that. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, considering it's egg week, I just want to throw in this little egg story. This is true. It really happened to me. I stopped at a place called Huddle House, which I hope they're not a sponsor. <laughs> stopped at Huddle House. Y'all know Huddle House? Not a, not a bad place, Huddle House. You're not quite good enough to be at Waffle House. You're at Huddle House, you know? <laughs> and the waitress walks over and says, well, what y'all want this morning? I said, I think I'll take me some breakfast. She goes, well, what do you want? I said, well, I think I'll take some eggs. She said, well, do you want regular eggs or do you want egg substitute? I said, well, I think I'll try some of that egg substitute. She said, well, how do you want that cooked? I said, boiled. <laughs> I want to see what kind of shell this comes in. <laughs> it's a scary world. Well, well, folks, I'll play you a song here. I'll guarantee you, if you, if you fill out your ballots, go ahead and fill it out, bet your money, because I guarantee you this song is going to win Song of the Year, CMA Awards, 1996, and I wrote it. This is a guarantee. This is the stupidest song ever written. 
George Bush, George Burns, George Jones, George Benson, George C. Scott, George Reeves, George Wallace, George Hallis, George Washington, George Washington Carver, George Jefferson, George Jetson, George Picard, George Harrison, boy George, by George, George of the Jungle, George Strait, Chris, George, Linda Day, George, George Patton, Phyllis, George, George Custer, George McClellan, George Foster, George Martin, George Thurgood, George Carlin, George Hamilton, George Raff, George Jessel, Tallulah Gorge, Susan George, Curious George, Georgie Porgy, George Clinton, George Siegel, George McGovern, Jeff George, George Lindsay, George Stanford Brown, George Lucas, George McRae, George Schultz, George Mikan, Gorgeous George, Gorgeous George Jr., everybody, George Orwell, George Wimp, Tom Wolfhead, George Gobo, George Michael, George Foreman, Chuck George, a guy I used to go to high school with, Georgetown, George Naismith, George Will, George Montgomery, George Steinbrenner, Georgie Fame, George from Mice and Men, George Allen, George Rogers, George Gilt the Gipper, George Gershwin, George Gervin, Machine Gun Kelly, his name was George. George Zaharius, George Kennedy, George Brett, George Mitchell, George Stephanopoulos, Chief Dan George, George Blanda, George Clinton, George McGinnis, George Rogers Clark, George Bernard Shaw, George Seifert, Eddie George, George the Animal Steel, George Pappas the Bowler, and for all you party animals, George Dickel, and George is on my mind. Thank you very much, folks. God bless you. <laughs> it was weird. What do I do with it? Give me that. You take that. I'll take that. I'll sit here. You know, you sit down here where you're supposed to. Right here. Right here. There you go. Tim Wilson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. George. <laughs> That's probably your real name, right? Now, the George song, I came up with that. Me and uh, Sandy Pinkard and Richard Bowden used to write songs a lot. We're sitting around in the Spence Manor one day writing songs, and I'm tuning my guitar, and I went, George Jones, because we all want to sound like George Jones. Right. Yeah. George Jones. And I said, you know, we ought to make a song where we put like 85 guys named George back to back. And they said, no, we're not. that's not a good idea. So I went and did it myself. <laughs> I'm on television now, and they're sitting home. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Too funny. English degree. What'd you do with an English degree? Does it? Uh, fold I didn't, I didn't do much with an English degree. I was, uh, you have to be a professional English person to butcher the language as well as I do, Tom. Oh yeah. But um, I actually kind of I took English because I couldn't think of anything else. My football coach was an English major, and I ended up with this this one English professor. S. Allen King was the meanest man that ever lived, I guess, was, was my English professor. He reminded me of Struther Martin from Cool Hand Luke. Remember him? What we have here. What we have. You're going to have to get your mind right. <laughs> and I do mean right. We'd have like 150 grammar sentences. I'd show up for class. We'd, we'd walk in, the bell would ring. He'd go, Mr. Wilson, number one. And I'd do it. Mr. Wilson, number two. I'd do it. And we'd just keep going till the end of the class. The bell rang, and I kept going the whole class. So, okay. we had he picked on you. Failure to communicate, me and him. <laughs> but I was, I'm, I'm, I'm technically qualified to teach your children grammar. <laughs> 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 it's a sorry world, isn't it? I like it. I like it. <laughs> how, much, how much do you use, you know, the, the Southern influence in your humor? I mean, do you, do you think that really defines what you do? Well, Does it, it defines, give you a certain amount of latitude? Well, we're getting kind of analytical about comedy here. It, it sorry, defines me <laughs> to most people because, you know, obviously I have a very thick southern accent. and uh, I don't know. I mean, I could talk about anything and it sounds southern. You know what I mean? Right. I could talk about 
I always tell people I could talk, like, talk about the 57 Senate hearings, and it would sound like a, a, com a Southern comedy bit. So. <laughs> but um, some people think you might can get away with more being a Southerner. A lot of times I think it, it hinders you a little bit because yeah. there's you know, some topics that are just... When you're a Southerner, people don't cut you a lot of slack. I don't know, you know? Well, it's like, they, they, for some reason, there's a certain... Uh, they tend to question intelligence a little bit once in a while. When well, you're I don't, I don't worry about intelligence questions. Mine has been questioned long ago. And, <laughs> and I got over that, but um, I don't know. That's a hard question. Well, then we'll See, forget I'm not, about it. I'm not intelligent enough to answer that question. <laughs> no. But you've got a degree. Yeah, I got a, I got a, uh, a degree. I was I'm the only guy that ever made. Man. Uh, well, you dropped. I was the only guy that ever made two D's in his major and still got through. So, <laughs> you know, I was, I was home writing. Uh, intelligent songs like the George song. And, there you go. Uh, great ones like Acid Country. Oh, hey, hey, hey. Tell me about, uh, the, you got a charity golf tournament coming up. Yeah, I think in about two weeks I'm going to play in a thing called the, uh, it's the Ronald McDonald House charity. It's put uh -huh. on a, a show down in Columbus, Georgia, and I finished doing a week in a theater there this past weekend, and we're going to do it is again that, in that two your weeks. Is hometown? Yeah, that's my hometown. Uh -huh. Columbus, Georgia, which is... Hey. Thank you very much. Which is uh, where... Coca-Cola was originally invented in Columbus, Georgia, 1886. And Dr. John Pemberton started out putting, I don't want to talk about it, but started out putting cocaine in the Coca-Cola. Had a little is, snap to it, didn't it? Yeah. Well, they started putting straws in the top of the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, we'll be down there in two weeks doing that. I'm going to be in uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina tomorrow night. And uh, it's Tuesday and Wednesday night at the Comedy Cabana down there. I want to get my plug in. you got to so, get that in. So we'll be there tomorrow night. And if you're in Myrtle Beach, come see us. If y'all go into Myrtle Beach, let's just get in the car and we'll all go together. That's right. He'll sing the George song the whole way, too. <laughs> I'm thinking about writing a song about the amendments. Yeah. <laughs> like the first through the... How not many the, amendments are there? 24. 24. I think Something about like writing that. a song called the Amendment Song. So if, if y'all hear it, or you hear it from somebody else, you know they stole it from me. So I can see you people just ready to go out and buy that record. You know what I mean? Well, you do have a CD you're working on. A, a new one coming out? Yeah, I've got, I put out three albums over, uh, since about 1993, and, and A&M Records just mm -hmm. bought our comp, and we're going to make a compilation that we'll have out probably the end of August, 1st of September, and then I've got another one that I'm working on we'll help have out the first of the year, with all new stuff. Well, that's great. We'll get out there and make sure we find it. Mr. Tim Wilson, you better see you again, Tom. It's always a pleasure, young man. George Johnson. Hey, Tim Wilson! <laughs> Thank you very much. How are you doing tonight? Good morning. Thank you very much. My name is Tim Wilson. I'm originally from the entertainment capital of the world, Columbus, Georgia. <laughs> yeah. But well, it's good to be here. It drove here and my car broke down in beautiful Laverne, Tennessee on the way here. It, not a bad town, but one of those pockets of America where it looks like education might still be against the wall. Do it. <laughs> looks like you pull out of the library late at night and a yeah, cop pull you over. And, Son, you've been thinking tonight. <laughs> Uh, yes, sir, I've been thinking, but I don't think I'm thunk. <laughs> well, your eyes is kind of red. Yeah. How much you had to read tonight, son? <laughs> well, I had a couple of books, but I don't think I had more than two. <laughs> well, what you got in the back seat in the Walden bookstore sack? Is that literary material in the car? Uh, yes, sir, but a friend of mine left that in here. I didn't leave it in here. <laughs> Well, friend or not, you know it's illegal to have literary material in this county. <laughs> Has it been open? Been open, but it ain't open now. <laughs> you been a smart buck with me, son. Are you showing a degree of intelligence to a Tennessee state trooper? <laughs> How about you step out of the car? I'm gonna give you an IQ test. <laughs> You scored 120 on an IQ, that's 40 points over a legal limit. <laughs> We're about to take you down to the Laverne Thunk Tank. <laughs> I got a 260 pound transvestite history teacher just gonna love you, son. <laughs> kind of one of those things. It's true, I sat in a laundromat in Laverne, Tennessee, about three hours. 
wiggling this fellow to fix my car next door in. How many of you ever see that woman in the laundromat? has got them pink sponge curlers in the hair. <laughs> the polyester shorts about 19 sizes, too small. The panty lines, and you don't want to see them. Yeah. Dirt around the ankles, a dozen kids, they're all named Sheila. <laughs> a rough woman. The kind of woman that lives on food stamps, but her husband owns automatic weapons. <laughs> Go to the store by buying a sausage. Open them up, eat the sausage, then drink the juice. <laughs> rough woman. And I ain't no about a fat lady. I'm talking big ass woman here. <laughs> the kind of woman can give Ric Flair a run for his money. <laughs> Kids' clothes are dirty as hell, but they live at the laundromat. Right? It's like they run out of quarters or something. Oh. Thank you very much. You've got a lot of fun. Okay. That was uh, from Williams and Green. You can see, you know, Tim would give up material that most comics would kill for, okay? He quit doing that bit. He would never do that bit again, and it used to drive me nuts because it was one of the best bits I think anybody ever written, you know, about learning. It was just, you know, it's just... He just used to get tired of his material, and when he got tired of it, he said he wouldn't play it anymore. And I said, well, damn. I said, what happened if Leonard Skinner decided to do that with Freebird? You know, if you go to a concert and not, not play Freebird, you'd have a riot on your hands. But Tim never really got into that. He said, oh, that's too bad. They ain't hearing it. I said, okay, whatever. I have one aunt that loves commercialized religion more than anybody in the world. She likes to buy those little cloths they sell, sends money, worries, that kind of stuff. Thanks in the back there, ma'am. Her favorite preacher, my favorite preacher, from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Brother Jimmy Swagger, ladies and gentlemen. I want to talk to you today. The United States of America is going through one of the biggest problem eras that's ever faced in the history of this country. Our young people listening to this demonic, diabolical, secular, humanistic, heavy, heavy, hard, heavy metal, acid rock, Heavy illicit sex filled, homosexuality filled, nasty, trashy, vile, perverted, family destructing, fire breathing, hell bound, unnatural, ungospel, unbiblical, ungodly rock, hard acid, heavy metal music. I don't know. You're getting your checks. I need some money. I'm building churches. Please help me. We're going to build them in Czechoslovakia, Argentina, Canada, Guatemala, Venezuela, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico. Cold, whatever it is. Alaska, put a cold on. It'll be cold. Hallelujah. Bolivia, Nicaragua, Rhodesia, China, Korea, Hawaii. Marietta, we're going to build it right across from the big chicken where we're going to put it. We were in a hotel room the other day. My wife and I, it was my wife and I, we were in a hotel room the other day. The telephone rang. I didn't really want to answer it. Oh, you laugh. Ha, 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 ha. I asked my wife, Frances, would she answer it? Jimmy, would you answer it? I didn't really want to answer it. I said, God, should I answer it? He said, Jimmy, answer it. I said, Lord, would you answer it? He says, I already know who it is. Jimmy, you answer it. I don't need to answer it. Something in my spirit told me I should answer it. I picked it up. A desperate voice came over that telephone. <laughs> it said, is this the Travel Inn Motel in New Orleans? I said, no, that's 4220422. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much. Yeah. Talk about songwriting just for a second. You know, Tim would, uh, you know, we were together a long time, so Tim would always call me from the side of the road, and Tim would carry quarters with him. This is way back before cell phones, beepers, or anything. He'd stop, usually somewhere by Montego on his way to Nashville or something, and call me at, at, at a payphone and say, Chris, what do you think of this? And, he, and he'd sing a couple, like a verse of a song. That's the first part. And I said, okay. He goes, what do you think of it? And I said, well, that one might work. He goes, all right, I'm going to finish it up on the rest of the ride home. I said, okay, we'll, we'll do that. He must have done that, I swear, 30 times. And that's how we got, I mean, Tim would stop on the side of the road at all times, you know, and for fine pay phones. I was with him a couple times, and we, uh, you know, Tim, early on, when he had his first record, the one he did himself, and he actually recorded it here and sold it out of the trunk of his car. It was on a little cassette. I can't remember the name of it now. It's been so long ago. But anyway, Tim would drive, and I was with him. We were in southern Ohio, and I swear there was nothing but cornfields around us. Nothing but cornfields. And Tim said, i got to stop by this radio station and give this guy one of my cassettes. I said, well, first of all, where is there a radio station? I said, I see corn. And he goes, I know it's here somewhere. We drive about another eight, ten miles, and you see it, I think, like an aerial. You know, you see one of those big antennas coming out of the ground out of nowhere in the middle of a cornfield, okay? I swear. We're about 30 miles outside of Dayton. And um, so as we get closer, I realize that, yeah, it's a radio, I think, station. It was a, a little place on the, on the at the bottom of the antenna. And... Um, Tim went in there, shook hands with the radio jock that morning. He says, hi, hey, my name's Tim Wilson. Uh, here's, my, here's my song played on the air. I swear he got more airplays that way than anyone, anybody else. I mean, he was the best guy for, for trying to get his songs on the air. He outbeat any PR company that there was. I mean, that's how he got it done. He shook your hand and said, uh, hi, I'm Tim Wilson, and, and, you know, play my song. And that's how it got done. And then when radio changed, it really kind of changed how the way Tim did business. It was, it was really kind of sad because everything kind of changed at the same time. But anyway, let me play one more clip here. Let's see, which one are we at, Reg? Where are you? You ready to do the Nashville Now or you don't want to do that one? Yeah, do the Nashville Now, okay? And again, if it repeats material, we'll, we'll keep on going, but I'd like to see them sitting on the couch. <laughs> Thank you very much. How are y'all tonight? Good morning. Before we get started, I want to just start out by asking, uh, how many people here are as sick to death of hearing about ice skating as I am right now? There you go. I mean, I think if these ice skaters are going to start calling themselves athletes, they're going to have to toughen up just a little bit. I mean, I feel sorry for the girl getting a pike in the leg, but I saw a professional wrestler take a fold-up chair to the forehead. He was back Tuesday. Yeah. So... I think that's what we need to do with uh, this Harding and Kerrigan is throw them in a Texas cage match and leave her, leave, uh, loser leaves town. What do you figure? Uh, uh, well, if I say the words right, it'll get a laugh. So. <laughs> well, uh, it's violence and sissy sports that's bothering me. Uh, so far, we've had a, a tennis player get stabbed in the back. We got a soccer player stabbed in the back. Now we got an ice skater gets a metal rod to the knee area. I'm just hoping that a pro bowler don't get shot in the next month. What do you figure, huh? Wouldn't you hate to see ugly shoes for a month? Wouldn't that be scary? Yeah, Tanya is obviously a great skater, but I think she's in the wrong sport. She ought to be in roller derby. That's what I think she should be doing. <laughs> That way she could beat Nancy's head against a ring post and nobody'd say anything about it. So yeah, that's what I think. But you know, I think if Nancy Kerrigan is a, a country music fan, she's a wholesome American girl, and I expect she probably listens to Vince Gill and Garth Brooks and Leroy Parnell, nice wholesome people like that. And 
Of course, Tanya, I'll bet you $20, listens to David Allen Coe and uh, Johnny Paycheck. What do you figure? <laughs> <laughs> well, I drove here, and my car broke down in beautiful Ringgold, Georgia, on the way here. See anybody? You from Ringgold, ma'am? The marriage capital of the world, Ringgold, Georgia. They'll marry anybody in Ringgold. It's the marriage capital of the South, is what they call it. You gotta be careful who you're standing next to. I mean, if you're just standing next to a woman, you'll end up married to her and <laughs> filing a joint tax return. So you gotta be careful, but uh, my car broke down there. You can't find a mechanic in a service station anymore. Remember when you used to could pull into a service station and a little greasy guy would walk out and go, check that oil for you? And you go, no, shoot, get away from my car. Yeah. Well, he did. I don't know where he went, but he's gone. <laughs> You can get out here on 24, drive your, push your car all the way to Alabama, right? Get it up at exit ramp. See that Amoco station, station down there in the darkness, that glimmering ray of hope. Roll your car down there. Do you get a mechanic? No. What do you get? You get a fat lady selling Cheetos who won't open the door for you. That's what you get. <laughs> I see y'all been there too, you know. It's after midnight driving is what I'm talking about. Won't open the door for you, will you? They run all you know. They won't, I'm sorry, sir. I just cannot open the door for you after 12 o'clock. I just cannot open the door after 12 o'clock. Even if this thing catches on fire, I just have to sit here and burn. I'm like, well, you're made out of glass and aluminum, ma'am, but I think I can get that fire hot enough to get you to open that door over there. You got enough firewood around this thing to set this thing up. And they won't let you use the phone. I'm sorry, sir. I just cannot let you use our phone. I can't let you in to use our phone. You can use the payphone, but it's broke. Well, I guess, man, you just go out to get married then, ma'am, because I ain't going nowhere. Now, why don't you get on your phone, call Ringo, get some bridesmaids sent over. I'll be over by the oil rack over there. And they'll start that drawer thing. Don't you hate the drawer? You know, they call it a convenience store. What's convenient about standing in 40-degree weather, watching a fat woman run across a wet floor looking for Slim Jims? You know what I'm saying? I don't understand what's convenient about that, but... But I run them around when they start that drawer thing. Ma'am, I want a Coca-Cola, pack of M&M's, chicken salad sandwich. I'm gonna be here a while, a magazine. Oh, what the hell, we'll go to a lottery ticket. She'll get back with a Coke. I don't think I want a Coke. I got a Snapple pink lemonade, ma'am. Run back there and get that. Not the mango, ma'am, the snap, Snapple pink lemonade. And pay before you pump gets on my nerves. Don't that bother y'all? Pay before you pump. Pump nine, you gotta pay before you pump. Sir, sir, you got to pay for your pump. I got cars on both bumpers, right? Like I'm going somewhere. All of a sudden, I'm going to be Fred Flintstone, pick the car up, move it over. And, yes, ma'am, I, I dressed up in my suit so I could go to prison over $8 worth of gasoline. You know? <laughs> Thank you. You ever notice that the women in these stores that think you'll steal all look like they have husbands in the penitentiary? Anybody else notice that? <laughs> well, I'll leave you with this. I came home the other day, something tickled me. I walked in and told my wife, I said, well, I'm gonna be out on the road, I'm gonna be working like a dog for the next month. She said, well, it's better to work like a dog than live like a dog. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. God bless you. Have a seat. You know, uh, Tim was talking about Ringgold, Georgia. You were in Georgia recently for uh, a requested appearance there. Correct? Yeah, I was uh, actually I was sitting in Florida in a in a what we call a comedy condo, and my wife called me and told me that the uh, governor of Georgia's office had called and wanted me to do a show for the governor. And you can't really turn the governor down, you know, because you know you start thinking, well, you know, maybe I'll wind up on death row sometime or something. Yeah, and, no, yeah. You know, need a little help. Yeah. <laughs> And so you did the performance. A, yeah, I did a it. it was, performance, right? Yeah, it was a show for the uh, state legislatures, st state legislators of Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, the northern half of the state. Did they have a sense of humor? No, uh, they did that night. Good. Yeah. Okay. Well, the album is called Tough Crowd, and I have to ask you, there is a piece in here called Garth Brooks Has Ruined My Life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was a song that we had out. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember exactly when it was out, but it got uh -huh. on a billboard chart for a couple of weeks, which was kind of a shocker for us. And it, uh, 
like I always tell people, went in at 70 and then it had fingernail marks all the way down to 75 <laughs> yeah. and then it dropped on out. But, but that record did, did well for us and uh, we're on an independent label and it's a comedy song, so we were pretty mm -hmm. proud of it. I don't think Garth Brooks was real crazy about it. Well, <laughs> probably not. So, so it's on the uh, Tough Crowd album, right? Right, that's on an album on Southern Tracks Records, which is in Atlanta, right. Georgia. We have an 800 number if you would like to uh, check on the... Uh, <laughs> well, there he is in his shorts singing to a dog. Yeah, it says radio <laughs> sampler Tough on Tough Crowd there. right there. Yeah, this is yeah. a little promo copy. 1-800-925-6937 for information on Tough Crowd. And you have a new album coming out in March called... Uh, we're going to call it Waking Up the Neighborhood is going to be the name of that one. Uh, <laughs> I had my next door neighbor who is a lady who I wouldn't even say her name on television. Uh -huh. wouldn't give her the pleasure. But she took me to, to court over my Pomeranian. I don't know if you've ever seen a Pomeranian. Yeah. Little bitty dog. Yeah. Let's put it this way. This dog is so small, he's afraid of my cat. That's how big okay. he is. I have squirrels in the yard that are giving my dog a run for his money. <laughs> All right, so the, so the story is on the album? No, it, uh, I wrote a song about her. Oh, okay. A song called uh -oh. I Despise My Next Door Neighbor, which will probably be the single. Okay. <laughs> All right. Watch for that. Watch for that from Tim Wilson. And watch for more music City tonight right after this break. <laughs> My wife was at Paula Dean on Food Network. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Southern as a chicken. That woman's like some sort of leftover Confederate spy or some shit. <laughs> whose job is to poison as many Indiana women with a bunch of food that doesn't actually exist. But she's making up stuff at this point. Today, y'all, we're gonna make a cat shit point chomp. With 400 pounds of butter in it. They get their blood pressure about 1,000 over 200. Thanks for killing my uncle, Paula. Imagine you go to her house for Christmas, you wouldn't have eggnog, you'd have egg club. Today, y'all, we're gonna make some barbecue ribs and fall off the fucking bone. I don't want my ribs falling off a damn bone, I want a bone and a rib. If I don't want a bone and a rib, I'd have got pulled apart. If I don't want a bone anywhere close to a rib, I'd have got a mick rib. You ever take a bone off one of them, get that fake ass bone? Well, y'all are just a lot, a lot more sophisticated than, than me. 26. You play Little League Baseball, sir? No, I don't. You're a puss. Did you play any kind of organized youth sports at all? Or you got a little plastic ass trophy for participating, dude, didn't you, sir? They didn't even put your name on it, just mailed it to you. We never got trophies. Not unless you hit a home run, won a championship. Marble bottom damn trophy. Too heavy to mail. Tall thing made out of lead and mercury. Painted in China. And your mother never ever seen a trophy. Oh my gosh, I never seen an actual successful person. Can I lick the mercury off your trophy? Because y'all didn't grow up, y'all grew up scared of mercury. Won't fish, won't eat sushi. Ooh, mercury get us. Ooh, mercury. We won't pass the thermometer without tearing it in half. Is that real, Mercury? <laughs> we used to go to school, kids, put your math books down, get your science book out, get your Mercury back out. Yours is dripping off a desk. Pick that up. You got something in your eye. So you had a carpet in school and air conditioning. We had asbestos linoleum tile, 35 windows up. The only thing blowing was asbestos. <laughs> you wanted air, you had to call Cliff at maintenance. Cliff, it's hotter than butt and two million. Get a sky blue fan roll down here at two million. These kids are in a sweat down here, Cliff. On the shake. So you went to school, you had to make sure that each child had the tools of learning and success and access to a computer. We didn't have access to a damn thing. I saw, I saw Neil Armstrong walk on the moon in 1969. I almost didn't get to see it because Doris Johnson from Audio Visual wouldn't hurry a fuck up with a TV. <laughs> and Johnson, they almost on the moon. Get the TV down here. I don't want these kids to miss this. They drank the tang already. <laughs> Tell Cliff to bring that fucking fan. So you had a drug problem at your school. Why? Because you had a Xerox machine. We never had any drug problems in school. Why? Because we had a purple ink mimeograph machine. Make them homemade tests. 
smelled kind of like shit, but kind of good at the same time. <laughs> Teachers hit them. Now, Johnson, can we get some more purple mimeograph ink to TV? <laughs> Tell Cliff to forget the fan. <laughs> it was America. We grew up in America. Y'all grew up in what I call America Puss. <laughs> Ooh, a bit of a gentler, softer America. Did you see the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre? No, I didn't. You a puss? <laughs> no, we were actually the pusses on that one. Texas Chainsaw came out in 1974, barely had a drop of blood in it. Scared the fuck out of us. <laughs> you had to like reach over and pick your fuck up. <laughs> now that narrator, the film you're about to witness is going to scare the fuck out of you. <laughs> the most macabre film in the annals of American crime. If you want goobers, you better go get them now. <laughs> Y'all know who the narrator Texas Chainsaw Master was? Yeah. John Larroquette from Night Court. No <laughs> shit. You gonna learn some shit on my show, man. Larry, the cable guy, don't give a fuck about you, man. I'm worried sick about you. He's trying to make a payment on a Learjet. I'm trying to make a payment on a Lear truck cover. Texas Chainsaw, they had that van full of hippies. And that one girl's brother was crippled. He wasn't handicapped, it was 1974, he was crippled. Handicapped didn't come out to 76. With Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter. He would go through the woods in a wheelchair. Oh yeah, he's gonna live. So your Texas Chainsaw Master, he had some sort of a bacterial infection in his nose and it caused his nose to fall off and the other kids at school didn't understand and they treated him terribly and his mother was trying to make ends meet working as a single mom and she lost her pension and her insurance and it was George W's fault because that fucker was from Texas. <laughs> Remind me to cut a live album next time you get over here. I've done 17 comedy records. 17. I've been on Capitol Records longer than the Beatles were. They did two billion units. I'm barely aluminum. But this is the show I drove 28 years to get to. And you fuckers are going to be entertained if I have to be here at 4 in the fucking morning. Let's get the guitar. How many of you like country music in here? Well, if you don't like it, you damn sure better start like it. It's about the only thing I can play. Are you not going to play Dr. Love? No. Uh, we, well, you know, Ralph requested Dr. Love. Seems like he could. <laughs> <laughs> Very inside joke about the band Kiss. It just kind of had to be there. They call me Dr. Love. Calling Dr. Love. I was just kidding, too. I've got the Gene Simmons hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Don't know anything about all. Kiss. So anyway, it's Tim Wilson with us uh, here at Motor Madness. He's the guy that, I guess you're doing mainly the demo, de demolition derbies because the demo man, demo derby. Well, obviously, I'm a comedian by trade, but... Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot about but that. But once mm -hmm. a month, I get to go out. Last week, we had the uh, tuxedo zone up to our knees in mud. <laughs> so I'm just proud to be indoors right now. You know? <laughs> so. And dress normally. So what are you going to do? You, you've written another song. You've been inspired recently. Well, here's a, a, a NASCAR song. A friend of mine here in Charlotte told me I ought to write a NASCAR song. So okay. I went off and did it. She named me Dale, Darrell, Walter, Richard, Petty, Rusty, Awesome Bill, Irvin, Gordon, Earnhardt, Smith, Johnson, Jr. I guess you could say Mama was a NASCAR fan. I was born in Talladega up in the stands. The fans all cheered the second I arrived. The loudspeaker said the boy's born to drive. We didn't have money for a pacifier, so I sucked on the valve off a Goodyear tire. A seven pound, eight ounce son of the South. Born with a taste for racing in my mouth. She named me Dale, Darrell, Walter, Richard, Petty, Rusty, Awesome Bill, Irvin, Gordon, Earnhardt, Smith, Johnson. Junior. <laughs> I got my first real stock car when I was nine. I know when mama bought off a Jeff Bodine. The Winston Cup people said the boy's too young. Tell a qualified second at Darlington. How in the world could a nine-year-old child hit 197 in a time trial? The man said mama ought to be ashamed. 
But by the way, son, tell us what's your name. I told them Dale, Darrell, Walter, Richard, Betty, Rusty, Awesome Bill, Irvin, Gordon, Earnhardt, Smith, Johnny, Haas. Oh, man. I got a Toys R Us sponsor and a new pit crew. Daytona loves little 52. The junior high school girls are all cheering for me. I'm out there intimidating number three. But I ain't got room on my cards or my caps or the helmet I'm driving with. To write Dale, Darrell, Walter, Richard, Penny, Rusty, Awesome Bill, Irvin, Gordon, Earnhardt, Smith, Johnson, Johnson. Jr. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. That is him. Okay. Nicely done. Nicely done. Little Very quick one. Too. Two minute. All right. Well, we. Uh, Mr. Bill Lowry, who I miss tremendously, is uh, the man who discovered Jerry Reed, and he, the great Jerry Reed, and he discovered uh, Ray Stevens and uh, Milton Crabapple, and I guess me, and uh, one of our dreams in life is to be mentioned in the same sentence with Jerry Reed and Ray Stevens. So I had a chance to work with Jerry, and I wrote this song, me and him did it together. I married a woman that talked like Jerry Reed. God just didn't bless her with the vocal cords she needs. She looks like Cindy Crawford, but that ain't the way she sounds. When we make love, I keep hearing eastbound and down. I work 60 hours a week, and I bring home my check. And she says, son, you got to take me out somewhere. I'll throw some groceries down my neck. So I took her to a fancy restaurant. She looked down her nose and said, now why don't we stop at a choking puke for some grilled cheese sandwiches? That's just a little... Tribute to Jerry there. Here's a here's a racing song. Me and Butch tried to get a hit. I think this got to what, Butch? 84? She named me Dale, Darrell, Walter, Richard, Patty, Rusty, Awesome Bill, Irvin Gordon, Earnhardt Smith, Johnson, Jr. I guess you could say Mama was a NASCAR fan. I was born in Talladega up in the stands. The fans all cheered the second I arrived. The loudspeaker said the boys born to drive. We didn't have money for a pacifier, so I sucked on the valve off a Goodyear tire. A seven pound, eight ounce son of the South, born with a taste for racing in my mouth. She named me Dale, Darrell, Walter, Richard, Penny, Rusty, Awesome Bill, Irvin, Gordon, Earnhardt, Smith, Johnson, Jr. And here's one, thank you very much. Here's one we got coming out on uh, Capitol Records, which obviously the Garth Brooks song didn't kill me. <laughs> they yeah, signed me up to Capitol yeah. Records, so. Anyway, Capitol Records is worried sick about this next one. It'll be out October 19th on a song, uh, little album called The Twang Thing. Here we go. Church League softball fist fight. Getting washed in the blood on a Tuesday night. What would Jesus do? Lord, he wouldn't do that. Knock hell out of a preacher with the softball bat. Well, the swinging shepherds from the sheep of the Savior were tied with the Sourwood Church of Christ. An example of some highly unholy behavior in a game that had already been protested twice. Something unbiblical must have been said for them to be aiming heat at a minister's head. Clocking the clergy ain't the thing to do, but neither's the high hard one on a O and two. Church League softball fist fight Rolling round the pitcher's mound It just don't look right For nice people from the church And the Sunday school class To trade the cup of brotherhood For a can of whoop Thank you all very much Thank you very much Ladies and gentlemen Tony Arata and Tim Wilson. Good okay, here you go, Scotty Cage. Yeah, thanks for doing this because uh, I couldn't get an early flight back to the funeral, so when I heard it, I was just shocked. The, the stories I have about Tim is when I first started working with Chris. Uh, I knew who Tim was, and he said, Chris told me, hey, he's at the, you know, in Birmingham. And uh, I went backstage, and, and I met him, and, and I just, just a brilliant guy, I thought. I mean, and all the conversations I had with Tim were never about comedy. 
because before I did comedy, I was a counselor. And I, I've had so many conversations with him between uh, talking about God, theology, or counseling. And then uh, uh, maybe a year and a half ago, I brought in a girl I was seeing who was a therapist. And Tim and her stood back there and talked for 45 minutes about the profile of serial, serial killers. So it was like, and absolutely loved it. And then, uh, and, uh, and a musician, I love music. And um, the last time I saw Tim was in Nash, I was in Nashville and I was stopping at a guitar center. And I just walked in and uh, sat around and I looked over to my left and I said, I, and I said, Tim, what? Like that, and he looked at me and he goes, Scotty K. And he goes, what are you doing here? And we just started talking and he said, he said, uh, and I tell him, well, I'm in here looking at a guitar, and I want to get a tailor. And he goes, Karen, I want you to meet something. Walks over, he goes, this right here, this boy's name's Scotty. He's the best fucking guitar player in the world. And I was just like, well, he goes, I know people say this about Nashville. And he said, but bring him right here. And he, and he told me, Scotty, come here, play something. And this kid just started playing, and it blew me away. He said, and, and uh, I was in a music trivia, too, and I was so impressed that Tim knew who Milo Lefebvre was and, and, and Bob Hartman from Petra and all these these uh, Christian rock artists that I knew about, and he knew I knew Milan, and he told me stories about Milan from here, and, let, and I was just like, so every time I saw him, it was something, but it was never about comedy, and it was like, and it was always the guy had a, he had a beautiful soul, and he always just, you know, when I heard about him, I was just like, man, because my memories of him was just how when I walked away from him, I felt like a better person, and he and he took time because. When I first met him 13 years ago, he was just, you know, sat down, yeah, Chris told me that, and just made me feel like a, a person. I was, uh, you know, opening, and he was, like I said, like Roy said, he was just a great guy, and, and he felt like uh, a friend. You know, I felt like a, uh, he was my friend after I met him for one time, and it was just, um, he, he's the only comic that, uh, and, and as comics, we know this, he's the only comic that I would always come uh, when I was off the road and he was headlining here, I would always bring my friends to see him and say, you got to see him. And I dated a girl from Ohio that stood right there. I said, this guy's the smartest guy I've, I've, I've ever seen on stage. He's absolutely brilliant. I'm a history buff too, so his uncle BS stories are just brilliant. And she sat there and she leaned over and she said, I can't understand what he's saying. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, are you kidding me? I said, this is the... He's brilliant. That's what I would interpret and tell. But she's like, oh wow, you know. And, and then the things he would say under his breath, I would just uh, on stage and the things. Uh, it was just to me. It was every time I saw him, you know. And, and there's only a few guys that, that like that, you know. And, and and Tim was at the top of my list that I would watch and just get an education in, and and not being entertained. But you get an education. You walk away. You learn something that you didn't know. Like. Who, you know, who played guitar on that song or who, who was in history or that, and I'm just like, so that George, that George song, he probably wrote that in, in 30 minutes, he probably, because it was all in his head, and you know, I just thought, um, so, just a, he's just a beautiful person, and, and, and I know I'm going to see him again, so, so, it, thanks, Tim. Hey, bro, bro, you can get off. Our groupies are saying Pig Landon? What are you like, Kerry Chesney? Oh, I wonder why Renee Zellweger left. Because you're making beach videos with no women in it. That's why she left.
Wayne says it rhymes, but fuck, I guess it rhymes. <laughs> Lil Wayne. You get Wheezy some Robitussin and Sprite, he'll rhyme any damn thing. I like Lil Wayne. You got to remind me of Miles Davis with a crayon. Well, I guess I'm not going to get a lot of laughs telling rap jokes to white people. <laughs> Everybody look and see if the black people are laughing. The black people are laughing. <laughs> see, y'all look at me and think I'm a southern white guy. My wife is a black woman from Buffalo, New York. Well, I'm just saying, I'm no longer a white guy. I might look like one here. But when I go out to eat with my wife, trust me, I'm a black fucker. Those old white women are going. I go, fuck you, lady, I'm almost 50. Skinner fans in here at all? Skinner fans there? Needle and the spoon, indeed. You're singing. Here we go. Pinsky and Gray. Pinsky and Gray was the first uh, comedians I ever saw at an open mic night ever. When I went into a, a club in Atlanta and, and looked up on the stage, it was Pinsky and Gray were up there on the open mic night. And, and it's very, very rare now to see teams. This was back when a team could actually go out and, you know, make a living. And, uh, but uh, but Daryl Pinsky was, was great. Mark Gray was, Mark Gray was kind of like Dan Aykroyd. I mean, I always, I always thought Mark Gray was, was caliber enough to be able to go to Second City and end up on Saturday Night Live. And Daryl, Daryl's a very funny man too. Mark Gray was, was something. Now one thing about Penske and Gray, they left me high and dry one time when we was out in the parking lot in Little Rock, Arkansas, and about four guys were wanting to beat the crap out of me. And those two assholes ran to the car and left me out there to fight them myself. <laughs> Was that okay? Perfect. Now see, here's J. Anthony Brown. First off, God bless J. Anthony Brown. J. Anthony Brown was, and 
I don't know how to exactly put this, but because I don't like to compare other comedians to other people. But J. Anthony Brown was the Richard Pryor of Atlanta, Georgia. J. Anthony was 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 he was the cleanup hitter. He was our headliner. He was the, the first time I ever worked a comedy gig. I was opening for J. Anthony, and J. Anthony's still, in my book, one of the three best stand-up comedians I've ever seen. And and uh, he was. For J. Anthony to be on this tape at this time, because a lot of us were just getting started, J. Anthony was an old pro at this point, and he was so funny. I do do things to my wife. His old uh, his old James Brown bit. His kid drinking water, you know. <laughs> and we was playing, <laughs> and we were over at Mikey's, <laughs> and Mikey farted, <laughs> and his mama beat him. I can still do, I, I bet you I can sit down and do an hour and a half of J. Anthony Brown's material. He was, he's unbelievable. And now he's a big radio star. Was that okay? He did do that. Oh, I, I can do, I can probably do, I can do Jay's old act. <laughs> Where in the hell's the band? Where in the hell's the band? Can I count it out? Can I count it out? And um, how many how, how many times you reckon you played here over the years? Uh, it'd be hard to say. I, I'd guess what twenty eight years. Uh, I used to do it maybe twice a year, probably. Then we did all our open mic nights and everything else. So I've probably done. Well, I messed up my math. I don't remember how much it is, but probably two or three hundred shows. And this, uh, and you play you play clubs. All, I mean, is there? Well, talk about there, the. Uh, there's not many comedy clubs. Well, up in up in uh, New England and stuff like that, I haven't worked. But there's not many comedy clubs that I haven't worked in. And uh, the punchline is is uh, it, it stays the same. I, mean, I remember when this build this this actual room wasn't here. I mean, they ran basically ran comedy in the South out of that little room over there with all the desks you know, pushed up against the wall. Ron D'Annunzio and Dave Montesanto and my manager Chris DePetta started this thing from the ground up and I believe, I may be wrong, but I want to say maybe 81, 82. And uh, Chris saw me over at another club down, it used to be down where the storage facility is now down at uh, Piedmont and Roswell Road. And, and I'd just run through the rain and he heard me tell a couple of jokes and became my manager about a year later. So, so but this is uh, the second place I ever told a joke in Atlanta, Georgia. I could do a Richard Pryor impression, and I wrote about three jokes, and that's that's how I started. But in those days, you could go out on the road with ten minutes, you know, make three hundred dollars a week doing the same ten minutes over and over. And now I don't think I can say my name in ten minutes. <laughs> All Travis Trent songs in the same. Hey, girl, All Marty Stewart songs in the same. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> I don't want to sit here and pick on Marty Stewart. He was an instrumental prodigy. He played in professional bluegrass bands when he was nine. That's hard enough. What's really tough is talking to your parents into letting you go out on the road with a bluegrass band when you're nine. <laughs> Mama, Dee Dee, I'm going to get in that car and throw in the cowboy hat. We're gonna go stand on a plywood stage and play to some fat people with lawn chairs. I already quit school. Well, you all be careful. I mean, I was relatively humorous when I was 10, but my father wouldn't let me go out on the road. One person's getting these jokes in the back. Ma'am, go home and get 10 friends and bring them back. Sit in the front row next time, man. Give me a reason to fucking get up here and do that. You're killing her. Just all Neil Young songs in the same. Songs, 
I'll just play you some stupid shit. <laughs> some old dude didn't want to retire, so he set the old folks home on fire. Yeah, they knew it was him, cause only he knew how, cause he manned the flamethrower like a Guadalcanal. canal. So he rigged a leaf blower to a gasoline can, he was sick of all the nurses and the raisin brand. He made sure the old ladies got out all right, and then he burnt the fucker down on Thursday night. He had a lot of balls for a man his size, he was kinda hard to catheterize. Yeah, and that he never was a bad pan man, when he had to go, the shit hit the fan. Oh, Jello, he could stand, yeah, grand that he never was a bad pan man. I think I actually invented that genre of music. Has anybody ever heard anybody ever sing a nursing home song? Did Prince sing a nursing home song? But no. Did Johnny Cash have the balls for a nursing home song? No. That might be what I get my Lifetime Achievement Award for. A little song for Bill Clinton, sir, baby. Suddenly Bill wants to go drill in Alaska. And John Edwards says that he'll vote for it too. He said, what well, up me and you? Go try out some moose stew and screw the caribou. Suddenly Bill wants to lay pipe in Alaska. Well, Clinton went up to Obama and said, if you'll make my wife Secretary of State and get her ass out of this country for nine months out of the fucking year, I swear to God, I'll campaign for you the last two weeks. <laughs> then Obama said, uh, we'll look at her record. Uh, we know she's kind of qualified. Uh, we know she was a very worthy opponent. And we may very well tell her to go fuck herself. <laughs> I'm not an impressionist, but I got the rhythm, right? You go up, you go up, you go up one more time. You go up just a little quicker. And then you go up and down. And say something about Michelle and the girls. And say something about a puppy. It's the Obamas. It took them, what, four months to find a dog? Looked at every breed. You know there was some discrimination involved in picking out that dog? Because we're from Georgia, they could have just got a white dog. <laughs> See, I'd have paid $20 to see Michelle and the girls go, Dad, we want a white one. Uh, I'm sorry, girls, we can't get a white one. We have to get a black dog. We can get a black one with some white in it. As long as it has papers. See, Obama tickles the shit out of me. And he popped the fuck out of Ben Lott, you know, I'll give him that. Give him that. What, sir? Oh, yeah, let's, let's figure out a way how Obama didn't kill fucking Ben Lott. Oh, he's done way before Ben Lott, you know. I'm sure they planned, I'm sure they planned to get Obama elected president years ago, sir. Let's wake the fuck up, sir. Seals went over there and kicked his ass the other night. Right, he just took the ground. We should have given it to George Bush who didn't do dick about Obama. George Bush. Somebody said it best. They explained it to him the same way he explained it to us. Okay. Sir, you're going to have to calm down about this Obama thing. <laughs> this is a comedy show, sir. This ain't a place for some kind of militant right-wing fucking conspiracy bullshit. <laughs> Obama came out and said, uh, I think my staff has learned where his crib is. And we're going to go pop a cap in that motherfucker. <laughs> we have a black president of the United States, sir. Get the fuck over it. He won by 54%. Clinton never carried more than 43%. Obama got 54% of the vote of the United States people. There is a black president of the United States. Wait till you get a real black guy. Then you're really going to be big. <laughs> He don't like Obama, so we immediately decide you're a racial bastard. Turns out you're actually not. 
That's the way I feel. Right. And I was married to a Jewish woman for 14 years. An Israeli Jewish woman. Who's the attractive lady? That is my lovely wife, Ronit Wilson. That's your wife? That is my wife. Wow. Yeah. She's done a lot of modeling and acting in the past. And, wow. and uh, she looks good for, uh, I have two kids at home. And she you can't tell by looking at her. Who are you from? Your daughter's with you. Right. Yeah, I brought my, my daughter Sophia, Sophia with me. Hi, Sophia. Hi, nice to see you. 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 Hi, nice I had a little girl a while back, which I'm proud of. I named her Sophia Lisa, which I named her after my mother-in-law. Which, but I had a son. I'd had a problem with my father-in-law's name Vixop, which means Isaac. So my name is Ass Isaac Wilson. So I'm gonna be with Motown or the NBA somewhere. Anyway. <laughs> kind of a dilemma. You know, have a hillbilly daddy, Jewish mother, be named Isaac Wilson. Too damn much pressure for one kid. <laughs> Have to be able to hit a 30-foot jump shot, spit red man, and do somebody's taxes all at the same time. <laughs> kind of a scary-ass thought there, ain't it, man? Well, I guess that's enough of my private life. Well. Brother, Ari Wilson, look over here at your daddy. You just walk like Uncle Pierre. He just took a walk real slow like Uncle Vietnam. That's the day everybody needs to remember where they are. He's getting sleepy. Which went over like a fart in a diving helmet. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get used to all this weird Mediterranean food. Stuff called hummus. You know what I Hummus. Where are you from, man? You're from Atlanta? I was married to an Israeli woman. Her mother used to live with us. She was from Morocco. And she lived with me for 10 years. And she'd come down every day and go, Dean, would you like some hummus? <laughs> now she lives in a place called Sterot, Israel, which is 20 miles from the Gaza Strip. She gets bottle rockets shot over in her yard every day of the year. <laughs> now who the fuck's wor word for it do you think I'm going to take, man? An authentic Israeli woman who can cook fucking hummus? Or some woman that read it on a menu and it came out fucking cold. <laughs> Don't be trying to correct the hillbilly. Really. <laughs> At your house, it's hummus. If you go to Israel and say hummus, it sounds like Hamas. You get everybody blown the fuck up. <laughs> At your house, it's green beans. You ever have any tabbouleh, man? Tahina? Do you, do you put tahina with the hummus? <laughs> Let's get with the program, man. Let's move on to something else. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff Gordon's game. Jeff At least that's what them only earn heart fans always say. Where he's using Vaseline on the 24 Chevrolet Jeff Gordon's game. He must be gay. <laughs> That's the only bluegrass lick I know. Here's all the southern rock I know. Play Freebird. Mullet's entertained for decades. <laughs> You know, uh, there's so many of us here, and I, I know we all have stories to share. I, I want to bring Danny Simpson up because Danny rode with Tim for how many years? Uh, eight. eight years in a car with Tim Wilson. I know Danny can't tell too many stories, but he'll tell one or two that we can listen to. And, and oh my God, I it's just I can't imagine. You know, I know I know a lot of them. I don't know all of them. But a lot of them, and, and Danny has so many, but then, Danny, if you would please come on up and tell a story. Damn, Chris, you're funny. You need any songs or a manager? <laughs> um, yeah, I was lucky enough to not only know Tim, but write with him for about eight years. And uh, one of my favorite stories was at the Stardome in Birmingham, 
Alabama. <laughs> Tim had gotten on some kick where he would pick up a 20-year-old in the crowd uh -oh. and just ride them like a rented mule. So this time, the kid was, uh, was sitting there, and Tim says, uh, so we got some 20-year-olds in the crowd. 20-year-olds don't know shit. You're in here looking for a cosigner, aren't you, sir? And just railed <laughs> this kid um, on and on. Um, and uh, he said, uh, gosh, how did he get <laughs> Don't get started. Man, I'm sorry, Chris. He, uh, he's railing this kid. He said, uh, you got any Lyndon Johnson records, sir? 20-year-olds don't know shit. Got any Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson records, sir? And uh, the kid said, no, but I've heard of him. <laughs> Lemon Johnson was a 36 president of the United States, sir. You ain't got any records. He said, you get to school Monday and you tell your English teacher, or you tell your history teacher, he don't know shit. This kid was 17, I think he said he was. So he said, didn't you have a family? Didn't they ever go on a vacation? Tell your parents they suck. You don't know nothing. 17, don't know nothing. <laughs> he said, where are you from, sir? The kid said, Napoleon, Alabama. Tim says, I got kin folks in Napoleon, Alabama. Kid goes, yeah, I'm your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorites. Another one was in Nashville. Tim was riding through a section of town that's known for studios. About every little house in the in the street is a studio. And they see two guys coming out of a studio. Tim is sure they're musicians. So he pulls this pulls his truck over and he rolls down the limb and he starts talking to this guy. Scotty Bratcher, greatest guitar player I've ever seen. You guys got to hear Scotty Bratcher. Go see Scotty Bratcher. It was Peter Frampton. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bunch more things that, you know, like I said, a long time. I love Tim. I know you guys all did too, and, and I can't tell you how much I miss him. I guess that's really about all I got. We used to, I went on the road with Tim for a couple years and we just rode around touring the world via every comedy club between here in California. And um, when we weren't doing that, we would take breaks and go in the studio and record his, his records, which I did a, the majority of those, which were a lot of fun. Um, I remember we were in the car one time driving to some club somewhere, I don't know, shit's all a blur. And uh, I was driving, and our partner in crime, Danny Simpson, was in the passenger seat. Tim was apparently asleep in the back, and we got behind a horrid wreck, you know, two semis. Right? One of them was a, a, a poultry truck, and it was, oh, it was terrible. And I remember thinking, man, if that, that other truck was a Viagra truck, there'd be fucking chickens everywhere. You know? And Danny started laughing. I, of course, I laughed because I came up with it. But <laughs> Tim was in the back seat. We just heard him kind of a rustle, and you know, that was it. Typical uh, Tim Bob stuff. So that night, we get to the show and all that good shit. Tim comes out and he's like, Oh, how y'all doing? Good to be here. We had a terrible time getting here. And he told the joke, right? And <laughs> everybody laughed, and uh, he just kind of pointed me in the back of the room, and I was just like thinking, You joke stealing bitch, you know? Which I do regret not. He used to uh, ask me about. I'd be willing to get up and do a couple minutes in front of him because he thought I was funny. You know? He was a twisted individual, but I do regret not doing that. Like, I've been up in front of 70,000 people playing the drums. No big deal. But I, I just, I couldn't do that. And I regret doing that. But I, I, I just, I want the, the world to know how special of a person Tim Wilson was. And, uh, you know, and I'll always love him. He'll always be a part of me, man. Always. Yeah, I'm, I'll talk to you about Friday tomorrow and decide if we even want to do Friday. But uh, but then, you know, the following Tuesday, I expect will be time to get serious. I got to do some comedy songs. But, but um, I appreciate it, Jimmy. I'll see you tomorrow about 1 o'clock. See you later. Nice. It'll have to do.
don't want to sit here and pick on gay people. They got enough problems with that hillbilly piling on. <laughs> Americans, we're a little bit hypocritical about that. Go to church every Sunday. Do not judge, do not judge. Love the sinner, hate the sin. All sin is the same in the eyes of the Lord. But <laughs> those <laughs> There's not a man in this room who wouldn't suck a dick under certain circumstances. Not one. And you see them all swell up in the chair. Now, wait a minute, now, wait a minute. You do not realize your priorities in life yet, gentlemen, until you have found what you would gladly suck a dick over. <laughs> have you found yours yet, sir? Do you have children, sir? If somebody seriously threatened your children, you'd suck every dick on Hildebrand Road behind us <laughs> to save their life, wouldn't you, sir? Of course you would. Why? Because you're a great father, sir. Mediocre dresser, great father. <laughs> now every man in the room, I'm talking to that. I'm a good father. <laughs> and that sounds right, but it don't feel right, does it? Sir? <laughs> Five minutes ago, if I'd have told you I was going to talk you into this, you'd have told me I was crazy. Now, you're going home a hero. <laughs> She's going to be patting you on the back all the way home. It's like a dick to save our children. You're going to get laid later, sir. You're going to see my name on that sign out there in about six months. I got laid last time I saw that day, so. And that is my job. You're welcome. Suck a dick, save a life. If the greatest father in America was going to die and you did it, he would live. If not, he dies. Is your selfish pride more important than his life? He's dead. He's dead, isn't he, sir? <laughs> Of course he's dead. You'd send flowers to the funeral, volunteer to Paul Bear, bring a covered dish, hug his mama, lie to her. Say if there's anything we can do. Well, there's that one thing you could have done. See, I just watch television differently than a lot of people. I watch a lot of Trinity Broadcast Network with Paul and Jan Crouch, pink-headed Pentecostal lady. They have my favorite preacher in the world, Dr. Charles Stanley, Baptist preacher from downtown. Looks kind of like Don Knotts. You have a lot of overly self-righteous women on that show. My husband and I have been involved in our church for the past 47 years. We've never ever missed a Sunday morning or a Sunday night. I go, man, when he suck it up, save a life. Yes or no? We've got a situation. <laughs> We're not really looking for church attendance. See, a paramedic on the side of the road would suck an to save a life. We gotta get him in. Load him in. A Marine would suck an to save a Marine. Not an Air Force person. But. I don't even understand this war. Why do we even have Air Force people? They don't have an Air Force. So what are our Air Force people doing? They don't have a Navy, and we can't beat them. They don't have Marines. You ever notice that we can't ever beat anybody who doesn't have equipment? <laughs> if you don't have equipment and don't have any schools, we can't fucking beat you. If you got equipment, we'll take your ass out in a week and a half. Bam! No equipment, we're fucked. I'm just about tired of trying to entertain this guy. Everything he says, we're just going to sit here and stare at him. Because any comedian who traveled the world knows that Southerners only laugh at shit they agree with. <laughs> Midwesterners will laugh at any damn thing if it's fucking funny. Yeah. Where are you from? Yeah. Well, you just ruined my damn theory. <laughs> You're the one supposed to want Obama to be president. Oh, no, no, I'm from Illinois. Oh, your great great granddaddy's gonna be proud of you, sir. <laughs> you already switched to the other fucking team. <laughs> Illinois. That's about a red light district of a fucking state, I'll say that. Because I've been to Soja, Illinois. A lot. <laughs> Yeah, 
Well, I'll just do another one. <laughs> Here's a little song. It's got a million and a half hits on YouTube. I got all cocky and arrogant about it. Then I found out a woman walking her ass across a laundromat parking lot got 10 million hits. <laughs> That's self-deprecating. You better enjoy it because there won't be a lot of it. <laughs> One more time, give it up for him back there. Jason Barnes, back in the back. Uh, let's see. First off, Tim was a, like an uncle to me. Meeting him was a great, great experience. And uh, I, I'm really good friends with her, with her his uh, daughter, Sophia. She gives her best to everybody here tonight. She wanted to be Skyped in the entire time, and I told her I wasn't going to walk around with her on the phone while everybody says hello. See that big, uh, big ridiculous? My father was, uh, according to Tim, was the he, your, your dad was the top three guitar players of all time. Which I guess that uh, Keith Urban was number two, and I guess Scotty Bratcher was number one. <laughs> Scotty Bratcher. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Tim was I went to, uh, I played Ch Chattanooga with him one time, and I came out on stage and I did a bunch of material, and I had this stuff that I was working out on evolution and how we come from apes and all this kind of stuff, and... It didn't go over very well in Chattanooga, you can imagine. And Tim, after the show came on, he goes, You did pretty good, son, but they didn't like that monkey shit. <laughs> <laughs> so that night I got to sit at the Waffle House with Tim and watch him eat four grilled cheese sandwiches in a row. And I'm thinking, man, I'm sitting with a legend. I'm going to get all of this comedy advice. Everything's going to rub off on me. This is going to be great. And then he proceeded to tell me for three hours how Ted Bundy killed these two old women in Columbus, Georgia. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. The guy was a fucking genius. And we're all going to miss him. And Deidre, oh my God. What a great man. What a great man. We're all, and his voice is going to stay in our heads forever because that accent, you can't wash that shit out. But love you, Tim. Love you guys. Thanks for having me up. Y'all have a good night. The greatest father in the United States of America, right there, there he is. That was about hard on Obama, but... Round of applause for Jimmy Buffett, man. Heading out to Sandy Springs, Georgia, for the late night Saturday show. I got my Jimmy ass Buffett shirt on. Large cleavaged woman in the front. <laughs> Round of applause for the poor black people that had to put up with my ass all night. Right. See, they just came to the show thinking it was going to be Teddy Wilson. Remember Teddy Wilson? Does anybody here remember Teddy Wilson? Yeah. Do you remember Teddy Wilson? You're going to feel bad when I tell you this, man. Did you ever watch Good Times? You remember Sweet Daddy? The guy with the green hat played the... Did you ever watch That's My Mama? Yes. Are you really a black person? <laughs> with a straight face, you're going to sit here and tell me that in the 1970s you didn't watch That's My Mama with Clifton Davis? He wasn't alive. How old are you, Mom? 40. 40? Fuck, I'm 50. I remember that show. <laughs> And they had the guy that was on Love Boat. What's, what's his name? Love Boat. Man. Isaac. And on That's My Mama, he'd come in and go, ooh, wee. You know what I mean? Man, I'm about to take your black person card away. <laughs> that little Charlie Pride, that little Teddy fucking Wilson. I had a bunch of white people in here. First show didn't remember Elvis fucking Presley. <laughs> oh, yeah? You think you know Elvis Presley, ma'am? So far, you can't pronounce... Humus working yet. <laughs> Nobody introduced a band by the name of Elvis Presley. Well, I can take this time to introduce the band. Or the guitar is John Wilkerson. The lead guitar is James Burton. Thanks is Jerry Schiff. The piano is Glenn Harden. Our drummer is Ronnie Tuck. The lady does a high bars with Kathy Westmoreland.
continue somewhere in the Stamps Quartet. Our conductor is Joe Grisho. And the man that brings me my scars and water. Who brought Elvis Presley's scars and water, man? Not hair and makeup. It was a background singer. Booty! The man that brings my scars and water. Mr. Charlie Hall. I used to be 11 years old, I don't land on the throw rod going, Fuck! I wish I was Charlie Hall. Just to hang around with Elvis, women screaming, panties flying, Fuck! I wish I was Charlie Hall. And I'd turn that off and turn on Teddy Wilson on That's My Mama. I'm disappointed in this crowd. This may have been the worst Saturday I've ever done at the punch line. Not y'all, the first crowd was really bad. Y'all were actually a pretty good crowd. But I'm just not really that impressed. I mean, this has pretty much turned into a seminar. More than a comedy show. See, I used to do the easier jokes. You know, like Danny Cook. You ever go to the Burger King? You ever go to the Burger King? No, we never been to the fucking Burger King. I'm here to try to, just to try to get past all that. And, you know, I, I don't really want to do a hundred things in the coloring book and sell that Cracker Barrel. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not here for y'all. I'm here for therapy. This is just therapy for me. Well, I'll play you that song and get all in. his leg cut off about two years ago from diabetes. He lost his big toe on the diving board and it got kind of civil war. And with appendages, he'll move over and you didn't lose your neck. And he always tells girls, no, I got it bit off by a shark. I go, a shark my ass. A shark won't eat 32 catfish in one sitting. So he's, he's, five, he's, he's six two and five eight. But he loves stuff called Chicken Comer Barbecue Sauce. Down in Phoenix City, Alabama, they have a place called Chicken Comer down there. It's a real famous barbecue place. And my brother loved that damn sauce. He'd sit up nights trying to do it and could never keep it from separating and shit. Went over to the restaurant, told the guy he loved it so much. The guy made him the national sales director of Chicken Comer Bucket Barbecue Sauce. Well, I went down and saw him last week. My truck broke down. I had to bring his car back up here. And the trunk's full of Chicken Comer Barbecue Sauce. So I'll be selling that shit after the show over the corner. If you never had it, it's really good. It's completely different than anything you ever had. Anybody know Phoenix City, Alabama? Yeah. Used to be the most dangerous town in the United States. It's the only town in the history of America that had martial law declared in it in 1956. You don't know a lot of shit, sir. You're going to learn some shit at my show, sir. You Illinois fuckers are the reason the Mormons are out in Utah. They wanted to be in Illinois, and y'all ran their ass off. I had two Louisiana fuckers in here last night. I threw both of them out of the place. Why? Because they were the ones that killed Bonnie and Clyde. And didn't have the balls to walk up and shoot them. No, shot them in the woods while they were trying to fix a tire. Bunch of assholes. Louisiana, we ought to sell that steak tonight. We bought it in 1803, Louisiana Purchase. Paid three cents an acre for it. I bet you if we sold it tonight, we could triple our money. <laughs> Mississippi. Don't ever feel sorry for Mississippi people. I hope the next three hurricanes that hit them are called Goodman, Schwerner, and fucking Cheney. <laughs> See, I'm from Georgia. We hate Florida people. Well, I guess we grew up our whole lives wanting to go to Florida. Oh my God, we're going to get to go to Florida. Put a float on top of the car. Drive six hours. Get there. Do you have a hotel room? Yeah, they're $100. And they should want to be near the water. Then they're $400. Now, we don't want to be near the water. We want to sit in a hot-ass asphalt parking lot with a float on top of the car and finish up these pecan logs we got in Valdosta. <laughs> Then a hurricane comes and rush back to Georgia. Oh my God, you have a hotel room. Yeah, they're a hundred dollars. And they're going to be away from the water. And then suddenly we're gougers. Is anybody here from Florida? 
Where are you from now? Where? Part of Florida. How far down from Florida is that? Up middle ways, way down. When you get south of Gainesville, Florida, you're back in Michigan. <laughs> Panhandle, Florida, you get the Ronnie Van Zant Skinner accent. Hi, my y'all gonna go to Panama City, man. All right, man. We'll see y'all over there, man. South Georgia, everybody talks about Jim McCarter. Nobody has any R's in the words, and they all sound like they'll get the fuck beat out of there. <laughs> Which was pretty much his M.O. the whole time he was president. North Georgia, everything got an R in it. Put the back tower in your car there. Put it back around there. They don't say y'all, they say Ewan's. Ewan's put the back tower in the car there. Put it back around there. Ewan's. Alabama, you open your mouth up real wide like this so they can see every tooth in your fucking head. <laughs> We all going on Wednesday night or Thursday night? I think I'll go Thursday because I got a dental appointment on Wednesday. Miss Shipper, everybody talks like Elvis Presley. You just can't quite get it out. You got, you got, you got that little stutter. Jimmy Swaggart had that. He's from Louisiana, but he act like he's from Mississippi. I don't really know exactly what happened at the hotel. <laughs> Louisiana got the French thing because they bought that thing from France. They just a little cooler than we are. You got to be able to live in the swamp. Turns out they don't know shit about living in the swamp. Really. Arkansas, you talk like Bill Clinton. You can't tell if they're laughing or crying. You're not sure if they're happy or sad. Jody Cash had that. He was from Arkansas and you couldn't understand what he was saying. Tennessee, I can't do. You chew gum, don't like Charlie Daniels. And he's from North Carolina. <laughs> South Carolina, you talk like Strom Thurmond. Oh, there's a lovely young lady at the end. You a D. Remember Strom? Turned out to be a little bit of a hypocritical fuck on the way out, didn't he? <laughs> Strom Thurmond, the only man in the world could pull out a Susan B. Anthony dollar. Look at it and think, yeah, I slept with her. <laughs> You'd probably get that Indian woman on the sack of Jewia, though. <laughs> But you could check it that Strom's baby she's holding on. <laughs> See, this is my old southern shit. <laughs> North Carolina, you talk like Andy Griffith. Oh, they gonna have supper. <laughs> He's gonna get Floyd to shave his neck. <laughs> South Virginia, you talk like Wood Button. Wood Button, you talk like Elmer Fudd. You can't understand what I'm saying. Can't say the word sooth. You say sooth. You know sooth. Pat Robertson's from Virginia. And he can't say the word sooth either. I live in Kentucky now. That ain't even a southern state. That's a neutral fucking state. You can always tell you in a neutral state to stop and get sweet tea. Can I get some sweet tea? We have sugar on the table. The lady you ever tried to dissolve sugar in cold fucking water? We got a thing in the south, man, called meth labs. One of my best friends named Dwayne Campbells from Kentucky. I used to do these tire commercials on the radio. He said, Tim, I actually tar commercial. I go, fuck, Dwayne, it's tire. He goes, no, here it's tar. I said, well, what's a T-O-W-E-R? He said, a tire? <laughs> See, I can tell by the way y'all are just chuckling at this. Most of you people who really, how many of y'all are actually from the South? No, I'm not, talking, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about moved here. I'm talking about fucking Southerners. Yeah, about 10 of them. Yeah. Well, I'll just go and keep going. You have more to say, ma'am? You're good? All okay over there? Ma'am, this ain't some sort of hostage situation or anything, is it? You're here on your own free will right now. You weren't trying to come out of the Best Buy and a dark van pulled up. Poor man won't leave that poor woman alone. He's got a Motel 6 coupon smoking in his bucket right now, man. That's not. Don't forget about that barbecue sauce. I guess I'm tired of Oprah Winfrey's ass telling me every move to make. I'm tired. 
learned about the stewards as telling me how to make a cake. And I've just about had my fill of Dr. Fucking Phil. Tired of looking at Tiger's ass and Shaquille O' Fucking Neal. And Paris helped me to fuck up a county fair. Just proof that you can be stupid and be a billion fucking there. I'm tired of that Simon's ass telling people that they can't sing. I'd fire Donald Trump's ass for knowing every fucking thing. Jim and Brad and Angelina's ass, I'm about tired of looking at them. And I'm about ready for Hollywood's ass to run out of fucking film. I'm tired of everything on TV. Everybody loves Raymond. Except for fucking me. Jimmy Bucket fuckers sitting in their front row. Women that don't know shit about Charlie Price fucking up the comedy show. Kinda tired of my own ass singing this fucking song. There's a lot of people's ass I'm tired of, but the list is too fucking long. And I can be wrong. You know, I think my first uh, run-in with Tim was uh, many, many years ago. I'd had a record, my first record come out, and I had a song on it called World's Greatest Shade Tree Mechanic. And I had heard Tim's bit where he would do this thing like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a carburetor, run it up underneath the spark plug wire, take the spark plug wire, run it to the carburetor, run it to the gas tank, and so forth and so forth. And I thought, man, that's a cool bit. I think I'll put that on my new album. And I thought, well, since it's been recorded, surely it's, you know, fair game and I could use it. So I put it on my album, put it out, and they, uh, it got played on radio. Well, I was doing a show one day in uh, Indiana, and I heard a pounding on my door, and I thought, that ain't room service. And I went to the door, and I looked through the peephole, and it was Tim Wilson. And I thought, oh, dear God, I'm in a mess. And, buddy, I opened that door, and I thought he was fixed to kick my A-double-S. My road manager came out of the shower with a Red Max blow dryer ready to fight him. And he said, let me tell you something, son. Don't you ever steal my stuff anymore. And if you're going to steal anything, you know I got better stuff than what you used. And he hugged my neck and uh, said, welcome to the business. And, man, it was, uh, it was awesome. But I'm going to tell you, my heart dropped through my nutsack because it scared me to death, but uh, we went on to be good friends, and Tim actually let me record the um, uh, Ricky Tidwell's mom was going to play football, which I thought was one of the most brilliant uh, things I'd ever heard at that point. Still to this day, one of the best uh, best songs I think has ever been written in the comedy world, so I was privileged to get to cut that. My version one as good as Tim's, but it was pretty close, but I'm going to tell you right now, man, it was great to, uh, to become friends with Tim, and... Uh, Although he did scare the teetotal piss out of me at a motel room in Indiana one time. Take care. See ya. You. you know, if you were at, uh, in Columbus, Billy told you a lot of stories about Tim. And basically helped uh, Billy grow up. He taught him how to be a, a comedian. He taught him how to be a man. He taught him so many life lessons that Billy's now passing on to other comics and other people while he, uh, you know, he's doing his thing. The one thing he always remembered, you know, when it comes to fans, Tim would stand and sign CDs or pictures or take pictures and sign whatever you had for as long as you could possibly do it. He would just sit there and, you know, sometimes it was like 
there's 200 people in this room, and they're not leaving until they get, a, get, get your autograph or sign, have you sign something or take a picture with you. And he would stay there for every one of them. And that's patience, man. But it also, he knows who his fans were. These are the people that loved him and wanted to see him and wanted to watch him. And, and that's, you know, one thing that I always respected about Tim. You know, he always cared about his audience, you know. And later on, they kind of turned on him a little bit. You know, they were like, well, we don't get him that much anymore. But, you know, Tim was set in his ways. He decided that uh, the way he was going to do it was the way he was going to do it. No matter what, you know, it was his way. You know, after he got a little bit older, he said, well, I know what I'm doing. And what I do is the right way. And we had some disagreements about that sometimes. But you're never going to change what Tim feels. He was the stubbornest man I have ever met in my lifetime. Okay, and I'm sure everyone here will agree with me. I, the only thing that I do regret in my life is that Tim wasn't a star and wasn't a household name. I mean, because he's somebody who's, you know, I, I worked with him for years, and I wish I was a better manager to help him to really be known throughout the country because people miss so much by not knowing who he was. Because he, you know, he really was. He was a comic genius. He spent the least amount of time on comedy, and he was the greatest at it, what he did. You know, he wanted to do so many other things. He concentrated on music. He tried to help people in the music business. He tried to write, you know, write uh, books. He did everything else. Didn't concentrate on comedy all that much, but that was what it was. I mean, he was a fucking genius when it came to comedy. And uh, anybody who really understands comedy, I can't tell you how many comedians look at him and go, damn, I wish I had that kind of material. I wish I could do that. I can't do that. I can't think of that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, it was my pleasure to work with him for all the time that we worked together. And, you know, I will always remember Timmy. I mean, there's no way that that's never going to happen. You know, and I'm always going to remember Tim. You know, he told me a long time ago, he goes, I'm not going to be the richest. I just want to be the best. And you know what? He was. He was the best. Thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, you don't have a drink to the back bar, okay? Thanks again. <laughs> well, 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 before you put it up, I got. I'll explain. I'll explain you the one that the show. <laughs>
What's your name? Scotty Bratcher. Scotty Bratcher, the best guitar player in the world. And that's on an acoustic guitar. You know, can't nobody play Steve Ray Vaughan on an acoustic guitar. It's unbelievable. You play on an electric guitar, he'll blow your fucking mind. So says Tim Wilson. So says Tim Wilson, and on this one, Tim Wilson is correct. <laughs> He's as good on a guitar. I think Jim Carrey... I don't think there's anybody who, who can go after Jim Carrey. They might be able to. But he's, he's to a guitar what Jim Carrey is to do a comedy. It's amazing. You had the privilege of going to a strip club with the late great comedian Tim Wilson. Oh. Yeah, Tim and I were at a strip club one time, and it was one of them places where the strippers come off the stage and start working the room like Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. So this dancer comes off the stage. She walks up to Tim and says, Would you like to tip me for my dance? And Tim said, No, ma'am, but if I change my mind, I know where to find you. <laughs> 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 Donnie, that's an excellent uh, he does it great. I can't say for sure, but I think she quit on a spot and went right back into retail the next day. Oh, boy. <laughs> I swear to God, the same as you want about Tim, man, somebody had to break the chain. He not only huh. changed her career, but most important, he saved me and the rest of us two bucks and pity tipping. <laughs> I swear to God. Now, that's how you make money grow. Now, I gotta go. That's wonderful, Donnie. Thank you very much. Is that okay, Steve? Perfect, man. Perfect.